What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. The New York Giants, they didn't waste any time. Brian Dable went out there, and he found himself his next offensive line coach, hiring Carmen Brasillo. If you watched yesterday's episode, we did pronounce his name wrong, but we also gave a glowing review of Carmen Brasillo and said that we thought he would be a great hiring for the New York Giants' vacant position. So we're going to go ahead and react to that in today's episode, discuss why we're so keen on Carmen Brasillo as the offensive line coach. Again, really high on him think he's the right hiring for this job I know that some Giants fans are a little confused honestly myself included by how quickly the Giants made this hiring how there was seemingly a lack of interviews conducted before the hiring definitely confused by the process here but regardless pleased with the hiring I think Carmen Brasillo is going to do a great job there's a lot on paper that will tell you that he's the right man for the job but now let's talk about the second half of today's episode the other topic that we're going to discuss a little bit of an interesting article came out today about Brian Dable and the Wink Martindale feud. And Alex, I think we could start with this topic and kind of just dive in immediately because it doesn't paint Brian Dable in the best light. I know you have some pretty strong opinions about it. Mine maybe not as strong. I know that the article written by Dan Duggan of The Athletic did end on a positive note for Brian Dable, but there are some quotes in here that are definitely concerning and do highlight Brian Dable's behind-the-scenes attitude and personality being rather abrasive and rubbing a lot of people the wrong way. So let's waste no time, Alex. I want to dive into that. I know you got strong opinions about the Brian Dable article, so I want to hear them. Um, and how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing pretty good. And, and listen, guys, um, I think that Brian Dable is more than capable of being a great coach, a great football coach. And it seems like he rallied the troops at the end of the season and the team played for him. Like they, they did not back down. They did not give up. And I think that's something to be very cautious of. But this article paints Dable, and yes, the end of it was rather, you know, it it was a clean send-off in terms of, you know, kind of giving him a little bit of love at the end, saying the players do like him. But the majority of this article by Dan Duggan, which, you know, I I highly respect, um, it paints a picture of the coaching staff having problems with him. And I think the difference here is he paints the picture of the players like Dable, but the coaching staff has had run-ins with him that have not been necessarily very good. And I think that even some players, and he even references um, Joe Judge and the intensity of his training methods and the intensity of his physical demands. Here, it's not as physically demanding. Dable, you know, gives him days off, you know, shortens meetings, shortens practice sessions. Like, he does right by his players. But the yelling and screaming and the abrasive nature of his game day persona has drawn some critical reviews. That's where I want to touch on. I think that this abrasive style reminds me a lot of a guy that we're all very familiar with, Tom Coughlin. A long time ago when Tom Coughlin was extremely abrasive, really tough, really just yelling at his at his team, and he actually had to tone it down. And he started to realize and get feedback that people are starting to get annoyed by this. People are starting to get frustrated by your your constant need to yell and and, and make examples of people. And he started to tone it down a bit, became a little bit more calmer, started to play some cool music at practice. And everyone was like, wait, who the hell is this guy? This is not the Tom Coughlin we know. And the Giants go on to win a Super Bowl. You know what I mean? So it's like you kind of see the change. Um, And and, and for what it's worth, being a coach similar to a player, you're always growing. You know, the job is never finished. The job is never done. You always learn how to be a better guy, a better coach, a better person, a better teacher, a better mentor. And I think Dable is more than capable of doing all those things. Some players respond better to harsh criticism. Some players respond better to that yelling style and that get your ass in the right spot mentality. But other players do not respond well to that. And I think there's a there's a difference between a balance and a generalized in a generalized way of coaching. I think Dable coaches in a in he has a, a balance, right? There is a balance of I think he does right by his players, but he can be a hothead at times. And I think the hot head persona that he carries is something that he actually can't control sometimes i think he gets really frustrated and really angry and really riled up and he his personality just bursts through the door and i sometimes i don't blame him for it because watching this giants team god knows i wanted to throw my tv out the damn window coaching that giants team i can't even imagine the amount of anger he had for minor d- details that have been messed up on a play by play basic uh, you know basis where they've been training and these things don't happen in practice why are they happening on game day and i think i'd be just as frustrated as him to be quite honest i i, I think last year 
We didn't see him that mad. This year it was a different ball game because the Giants were failing, and we saw the worst side of Dable at times, and I think a lot of coaches were rubbed the wrong way. I think that maybe this is something he needs to learn about himself, that his reactions rub off on people, and, pe- and those people react, and it got to the media. It got so bad that there are stories being leaked about him. It got so bad that Wink Martindale tension, Wink Martindale started to play chess with him behind the scenes and in public, and it materialized to him cursing him out and slamming the door in his face. I don't think this was solely on Wink, and I don't think it was solely on Dable. I think it was a mutual misunderstanding. It was a mutual tension that was building that kind of ended up going down in this way. I think I put more on more of the blame on Wink because he reacted awful at the end. He did not take this as a professional, and at the end of the, the end of the day, it's a job. And I think that there was a lot more on Wink's plate that he that you know than it was Dable. But I don't think that Dable is excused of his role in this in this entire sequence. I want to get your take on this. I think that if there's anything to come away from this, I think Dable ha- could actually learn from this equation, to learn from this scenario, this experience, that maybe he needs to tone down the yelling, tone down the aggressive, abrasive personality on game day, which is hinted at in this article. Um, clearly, some coaches did not like this. Um, I think that breeds a lot of negative energy, um, and I do think that there is a balance. I think that Tom Coughlin figured it out. I think that Dable can more than figure it out. And I still appreciate the fact that his players fought for him. And I, th- I do think he's doing a lot right, but I still think the job is never done. So the job is never done. And kind of how I'll respond is you're saying that Brian Dable needs to learn from this, needs to make changes. I already feel that he has. That's why I'm not as flustered by this article as maybe you are or some other fans. I noticed a change in Brian Dable towards the end of the season. The Giants started winning more games, and maybe that's correlated. Maybe it's because they were winning that we saw him less hot-headed. But honestly, I think even if you if you think back on even that Jets game, I don't remember him having outbursts. The outbursts were really in the beginning of the season, the Dallas game, the Buffalo game. But I feel like after the halfway point of the season, I think he recognized that his sideline feuds and antics were hurting the team and to me personally and again I'm not on the sidelines I'm watching through the broadcast it looked like he toned it down and like he did kind of relax a little bit more even in some games like the Philadelphia game on Christmas Day we know how intense of a game that was how the Giants were just a few plays away from pulling off that upset Brian Dable had many opportunities to start screaming and throwing fits and getting really angry and passionate on the sideline. I didn't see him do it. I saw him have a lot more composure in those final weeks of the season personally. So that's why my reaction to this article might not be as intense. I agree. Brian Dable does need to be better at these things, but I think he's already getting better at these things with the sideline composure. So that's kind of where we see it a little bit differently maybe, Alex. I think that when you're looking at this past season from Brian Dable, I mean, I was pretty critical of him at the beginning of the season. The tablet that he threw down to the ground against the Seahawks uh, right next to Daniel Jones, it almost hit Daniel Jones' lap. I was extremely critical of Brian Dable for that. I thought that was completely unprofessional. I thought it was childish and immature and that it was a massive mistake that could draw, that could cause a huge rift in that locker room. Thankfully, it didn't seem to do that. The players seemed to respond to his passion and his energy, that fiery behavior, and from what it, for what it's worth as well, we know that that is attractive to players because we spoke to Bobby O'Karake and he said that Brian Dable, his leadership and his passion is one of the things that caused him to sign with the New York Giants. We know that from speaking with Bobby O'Karake and we've heard from other players that Brian Dable's passion is a draw for them. But like I said, back when he threw that tablet down at Daniel Jones, that was child, childish and immature. He can't keep doing those things. That's going to come back to haunt this team. It did come back to haunt the team, but he also did stop doing those things, in my opinion. I think towards the end of the year, we did see a more composed Brian Dable. And I like that you brought up the comparison to Tom Coughlin, because if you go watch the documentary that the Giants have on that Super Bowl winning season when they upset the Patriots, the 18-1 and Patriots, uh, that offseason... If, I don't know if you even know this, Alex, Michael Strahan almost retired because he hated Tom Coughlin so much. Right before that magical run that maybe never would have happened because Michael Strahan hated Tom Coughlin so much that he almost retired. But then he came back, Tom Coughlin won him over in some way, somehow, some way, and they ended up having a mutual respect. Maybe it wasn't like they were buddies and they loved each other, but they had a respect for each other and they understood that this was the way that things were going to get done. And then they went and got it done, and they won a Super Bowl. So I think that's kind of what I think of when you make that comparison with Brian Dable's fiery behavior. Not every player is going to love it. Not every coach is going to love it. 
but there are going to be groups of coaches and groups of players who buy into it, and it's going to pay off, hopefully, right? We've seen it not pay off. It didn't pay off with Joe Judge. It didn't pay off with Matt Patricia over in Detroit when he was the head coach. It pays off for some coaches. It doesn't pay off for others. I think that one thing that Brian Dable has going for him that some of those other coaches didn't have, he is just a genuinely smart offensive coach. Like He's a great quarterbacks coach. He's a great offensive coordinator. He has those things going for him. So at the worst case, he can fall back on his skill. It's not always about the passion and the leadership for NFL coaches. Sometimes you'll get a really passionate guy who's a great leader, and the results aren't there because they maybe don't have all of that skill, all of that schematic skill that makes a football team good. Brian Dable, at the very least, we know that he has that. He does have those skills um, schematically and offensively on, on that side of the football. So I think that he'll fall back on that, and now it's just about becoming a more composed leader. And again... I think that he started to do that towards the end of the year. Now, did he start to do that to appease Wink Martindale and try to mend that relationship? I hope not. I hope that he just recognized that it was best for the team, that he calms down a little bit. And uh, if that is the case, I think going into this 2024 season, I think Brian Dable will be a little bit more calm, a little bit more relaxed, a little bit less quick to anger, and it will result in a more cohesive unit on the football field and a better team. Because again, I think that it's correlated. You know, whether you want to say that he was more composed in those final weeks because the team was winning or the team was winning because he was more composed. I'm not sure which one it is, but obviously there's some sort of correlation there because we did see a more composed Brian Dable. So I think that the more composure that he demonstrates going forward, the better for this team. He's still going to have his fiery moment moments. I mean, listen, a lot of the times when he was getting angry on the sidelines, he was getting angry at the referees, and it was because he was having his players' backs. And the players recognize that. They understand that, and they appreciate that. If you think back, Alex, to um, the Minnesota Vikings playoff game last year, I remember Brian Dable getting into it with a referee. He lost his cool in that playoff game. The Giants still won that playoff game, okay? And he lost his cool not over a player, but over a referee who did his player wrong. Those are the things that the players recognize. That's what stand out to them more than him getting angry at an assistant coach, in my opinion. So, yeah, I know that... Some of these quotes on game day, he's a madman. It's just brutal. Yeah, that paints him in a bad light. He's calling out coaches and he's making it personal. That also paints Dable in a bad light. These are direct quotes from team sources in this article. It's to the point where you've got to take your headsets off or take one ear off. He's just constantly screaming. It's like, geez, I can't even think. These are problems. This is stuff that Brian Dable needs to stop doing, like making it personal, screaming so much that the coaches can't coach. Those are things that I think... He'll probably read this article, Brian Dable will read this and say, yeah, you know what, I probably can calm down a little bit. So if he doesn't learn from this season and he doesn't improve next year, then the Giants know that they don't have their guy, that they're wrong, and they will fire him, I'm sure, after next season. But if he does learn from these things and he does improve, the Giants win more games next year and we see a more composed Brian Dable, then we know he we have a smart guy in that head coaching chair who can adapt, who can grow and evolve. Listen, he's a human being at the end of the day. He's not perfect. No quarterback is perfect. No head coach is perfect. No defensive coordinator is perfect. They're humans. He's got his flaws. If he works through them and he improves on them, that's all it's about. Getting better a little bit day by day. And if Brian Dable does that, he improves some of these things. I have no doubts in my mind that he's going to continue to be the coach for the New York Giants and a good one. I still believe he's a good coach. This doesn't really change that for me. I think a lot of this, probably a lot of his lost composure he probably knew that Wink Martindale was running a coop behind the scenes and trying to undermine him the whole time. Because as we learned, there was a secret Illuminati of defensive coaches, Wink Martindale, the Wilkins brothers, maybe a few others, all trying to run a coop on Brian Dable. I'm sure he knew that, and that played a part in some of his anger and frustration on the sidelines. So again, I'm not totally worried about this article. Like I'm not going to overreact to it. I think that Brian Dable showed more composure towards the end of the year, um, and I have confidence in him still going forward. But we can talk about some other coaches on the staff. Now, Alex, I do want to talk about Carmen Brissolo. Again, we gave a glowing review of him in yesterday's episode where we looked at three potential options for the Giants to target. They had already found their guy. We didn't know that at the time. But Carmen Brissolo is the one that they hired. I know we spoke highly of him yesterday. But, Alex, let's let's talk some more. Um, why are you excited about this hire, and why do you think that the Giants probably got this one right? Well, I'll start off with one narrative that a lot of people are painting. It's that the Giants rushed this hire. Um, for the people that think they rushed this hire, and yes, they only interviewed one guy, at, so we know. It's possible they could have reached out to 10 different people, and, you know, Mike Munchak said, nah, I'm not interested. This guy said, nah, I'm not interested. Like, you know, you don't know until you know. I think there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes, so I would refrain from making assumptions on that front. However, let me ask you a simple question. 
good teams that have great coaches do not let those coaches leave. The Giants just got blocked twice from the Atlanta Falcons for their off- for their offensive line coach to interview and their special teams coordinator. So I'll ask you again. Why on earth would a good team let a good coach leave? It doesn't freaking happen. So if you're the Giants and you just watch what happened to the Raiders and suddenly Brasillo's available and they're like, oh, wow, okay, this is kind of unique. A good offensive line coach just got released because they're overturning their coaching staff right now. Maybe we can swoop in and get one of their good coaches. The Giants did just that. Why did they rush this hire? Because they wanted to go steal a good a good coach from a team that shouldn't have let a good coach leave. And I will tell you right now, I was scouring uh, the internet. I was looking all over social media for information on Brasillo. You want to know what I learned? A whole hell of a lot. The Giants' offensive line, my friends, is far better in terms of uh, resource allocation. We've, re- we've given more resources to the offensive line than any other team in football since 2020. And it's by a long shot. It's not even close, guys. Like, it, if you could see the graph I'm staring at right now, I didn't even see the Giants. They were so far up in the right uh, in terms of resource allocations. So here's a couple things that will give you information on how the Raiders' offensive line fared over the last couple of years. So he took over the position in 2022. So last year, or rather 2022 and 2023, he was the offensive line coach. Let's take a look at last year's offensive line for the Raiders. Want to know what their resource allocation looked like? They had a first-round pick at left tackle, a third-round pick at left guard, an undrafted free agent at center, an undrafted free agent at right guard, and a fifth-round right tackle, and they ranked a Above average. In fact, they gave up fewer than half the amount of sacks the Giants' offensive line gave up. Should, should already convince you that we just got a much better coach than what we had previously. Because we have multiple first-round picks, a second-round pick at center. I think Ben Bredesen was a fourth-round pick. And, you know, Mark Lewinsky was a free agent signing. So... You look at what the Raiders had. One of their starting offensive guards, a guy that uh, Anthony just wrote about and he'll probably tell you about in a couple minutes, Greg Van Roten. Greg Van Roten was one of the top pass-protecting guards in football last year. And I have a lot of friends that are Jets fans. Don't ask me why. I don't like to associate with them. But I do anyway because I'm childhood friends with them. But truth is, I asked them about Greg Van Roten. You want to know what they said? He was one of the worst guards I have ever seen in my life. Last year... Raiders went out and got this guy, journeyman guard, ended up becoming one of their best players last season on offense. You want to know, during first the first year of Brasillo's, um, uh, I guess, tenure with the Raiders, two years, 2022, you want to know who led the NFL in rushing yards? Josh Jacobs. He was injured last year. Their running game fell apart a bit because their star running back was out. Suggests that the, the Giants may be interested in bringing back Saquon Barkley to run behind a scheme that obviously is going to be better. Um, so kind of like right off the bat, you're seeing – The Raiders did a lot with a little, a lot with a little. The Giants did absolutely nothing with a lot. So, you know, you're seeing kind of the difference here. Of course, the Giants went through a lot of injury. I'm not discounting that. Um, But I don't know why that happens. Could be MetLife, could be their training regimen. Who knows? Brasillo's a good dude. He's a collaborative guy. He He loves what he does. If you go watch the video of him, um, they mic'd him up during practice, during training camp, and he is a blast to follow, man. He loves, he has a true passion for what he does. Not to say what Bobby Johnson didn't, but just watching Brasillo, he's the type of guy you want in your you want in your locker room, you want on the field, coaching your guys up. Um, he's a perfectionist. He knows what he's doing. He has a really good system about his blocking scheme, a really good concept that he's going to really bring to this team, and I think it's going to be strong for us. But he just knows how to develop guys. He is refined in developing talent. Now, I'm selling you, Brasillo. I'm not saying he's going to change this team. I'm not saying he's going to be amazing. I'm not saying he's going to save our offensive line. But what I am saying is that he's got the credentials to do it, right? He's got the capacity to make this line great, if not above average. And guys, honestly, I can't even imagine what a Giants offensive line being average looks like, let alone above average with all the resources we've dumped into it. We're going to save some money on Mark Lewinsky, you still got some good talent there. I think we can sign a free agent or two. You maybe you, you spend another mid round pick, maybe a second round pick on a guy that's developmental that Priscilla likes and he can he can work with. There's opportunity here, but I'm really confident that he's going to do a solid job. Am I saying he's going to do great? No, I just think he's got the credentials and the and the, the background to be a really good offensive line coach. For those that are questioning the method, the process, let just remind you once again: good teams don't let great great coaches leave. One of them in Brasillo somehow shook free from a Raiders team that is in, in flux, that is overturning their position coaches right now, and we got lucky. That's actually how I perceive this move. I, I like that point. I think that's the right takeaway from this, is that the New York Giants recognized there was a coach available, a good coach available, 
and that if they didn't hire him as soon as possible, somebody else would. They couldn't drag their feet on this. Honestly, I think that's how they looked at it. They wanted Carmen Brasillo. If they dragged their feet, another team was going to swoop in and hire Carmen Brasillo. So they wanted to make sure that they hired him before anybody else had the opportunity to. Now, the other thing that you mentioned, the Giants don't have to report who they interview for assistant coaching uh, positions. They don't have to do the Rooney rule. They don't have to look at those coaches and report everything to the league, to the reporters. That's not how it works with assistant coaches. It works that way for head coaches. You, you'll know everybody that an NFL uh, team interviews for a head coaching job and a GM job, but you won't know that for assistant coaches. So it is more than possible that the New York Giants interviewed 10 candidates for all we know. It's also possible that they did just interview the one candidate, but we do know that they got blocked on another candidate, maybe on another two or three that we don't know. The New York Giants, though, I think that it's definitely possible they took a harder look at some of the candidates out there. They didn't find much. They recognized somebody who was really solid and who they knew they wanted to hire, and they wanted to make sure that they hired him before anybody else had the opportunity to, and that's why they landed on Carmen Brasillo. And again, I'm happy with this hiring. All the reasons that you just mentioned, Alex, he got a lot out of a little there in in uh, Las Vegas. There was a severe lack of talent on that offensive line. They were starting a first-round pick, a third-round pick, two undrafted free agents, and a fifth-round pick, and they played a really good football. And if you look online and you watch some of these videos of Carmen Brasillo, the mic'd up where you see his personality on the sidelines during training camp, or if you watch, he's got some breakdowns of schemes and different plays that he likes to run in Las Vegas. Those are really fun to watch because you see his actual coaching style, like what he does when he breaks down film and some of his thoughts and uh, opinions on the concepts uh, in the Raiders running game, the crack toss scheme. I really like that video. I posted it on my Twitter yesterday where he broke that down and he emphasized the importance of having a fullback, something the New York Giants don't currently have. They don't have a fullback on the roster. I think that hiring Carmen Brasillo indicates that they're probably going to get themselves a fullback this offseason to uh, match the the schematics of what um, of what Carmen Brasillo likes for his offensive line. So I think that you're going to see a much better coached unit uh, this upcoming season. I don't want to make any promises on that. The New York Giants find a way to disappoint me year in and year out. So while I really like this hiring and I think it's a good one, I could absolutely be wrong, and we could be hiring a new one next offseason. Totally possible. But based on everything that I know about Carmen Brasillo, the way that he got talent uh, where there wasn't any talent to play well, uh, I think it's really impressive what he did for two years over um, in Las Vegas. And I think that some of those players might recognize that as well and follow him over to New York. I want to talk about this, Alex. I wrote an article this morning, three Raiders, free agents the Giants could target to reunite with Carmen Brasillo in the offseason. Um, and the first one that I'm going to mention, you just mentioned him, Greg Van Roten. He was really bad with the New York Jets. He was the seventh ranked guard in the NFL this season, according to Pro Football Focus. Uh, he's been a journeyman his entire career. He's never been able to establish himself as a top offensive lineman in the league. He's been a backup for most of his career. But this past season, with the Las Vegas Raiders, he allowed only five sacks and 21 pressures and, again, had a very solid pass blocking grade. And, again, I think that's a testament to Carmen Brasillo. And I also think that that's a testament to the future of Greg Van Roten. He finally broke out, broke out as a competent starter at 33 years old for the Las Vegas Raiders. I think that if he wants to continue playing football, he's going to want to play somewhere that's going to view him as a starter. Carmen Brasillo probably views him as a starter. So as the Giants head into free agency this March, I think that Greg Van Roten, a reunion here with Carmen Brasillo makes a lot of sense. Now, again, I don't think that he's going to be the savior of the Giants offensive line. I think that his history, his career history, his track record tells you he's actually not a very good player maybe had a really good year here with Las Vegas, but probably not a very good player. But then again, maybe it's just Carmen Brasillo and the way that he was coaching him really clicked. So maybe they can find that magic in a pan and do it all over again. So I'll say, I think Greg Van Roten is going to be a top target, 33 years old veteran hiring, probably a cheap, very cheap one-year deal to be the Giants starting guard um, this upcoming season. I think it makes a lot of sense to reunite him with Carmen Brasillo. But then another player that I will mention here, Alex, Jermaine Illuminor. Now, this is another late-round draft pick, fifth-round pick. His history with Carmen Brasillo doesn't just um, start and end with their time shared in Las Vegas. It actually dates all the way back to 2019 with the New England Patriots. That's where Jermaine Illuminor started his career with the Patriots. That's where Carmen Brasillo started his NFL coaching career. In 2019, he joined as an assistant offensive line coach, took over as the full-time offensive line coach for the Patriots in 2020. Uh, Jermaine Illuminor was with the Patriots 2019 and 2020 
went to the Raiders in 2021, and then, of course, Carmen, Carmen Brasillo joined him in 2022. So there's a long line of history here between Jermaine Illuminor and Carmen Brasillo. Jermaine started 14 games for the Raiders last season at right tackle. He allowed just six sacks, 28 total pressures, had a 68.5 overall PFF grade, ranking 35th out of 84 at the tackle position. This is a cheap cheap signing for sure because he's not in the upper echelon, but this is an upgrade over what the Giants have had at right tackle. Evan Neal has not been playing 35 out of 84 ever in his career. Jermaine Illuminor is going to be a very cheap signing uh, if the Giants do end up targeting him. He's going to give you above average to average offensive line play, and again, I've been saying this for a long time. Above average to average for the New York Giants is a massive upgrade over the worst in the NFL. So Jermaine Illuminor makes a lot of sense for this team, especially if they do decide to move Evan Neal into guard. At the very least, though, I think that Jermaine Illuminor should be signed just to give Evan Neal some competition. If Evan Neal doesn't show that he's a good enough player to be a full-time starter next season, you bench him and you put in Jermaine Illuminor. And at the very least, Jermaine Illuminor can be a damn good swing tackle for your team and a depth piece. So I really like the idea of signing Jermaine Illuminor. Again, he has history with uh, Carmen Brasello dating all the way back to 2019 with the New England Patriots. And most recently, he just had a career year, uh, two career years, actually, back-to-back seasons under Carmen Brasillo uh, with the Raiders were his best seasons of his career. Um, so I think Illuminor makes a lot of sense. So Alex, I want to get your take on those guys. Uh, first of all, I know you already gave your take on Greg Van Roten. You're not super high on him, but it seems like you're kind of excited by this uh, player that I identified here in Jermaine um, Illuminor. Yeah, I mean, look, I said it a couple weeks ago. If the Giants go into the 2024 season with Evan Neal starting at right tackle and no competition, they are in for a massively obvious surprise that they're going to struggle again because not only, like, okay, even if Priscilla manages to make Evan Neal better, he is still injury prone right now. He is coming off two ankle injuries, one of them requiring surgery. So if you go into this upcoming season um, without support, without competition, you are going to regret it. Now, Illuminor, for what it's worth, has not only the coolest name ever, but he's 29 years old, a former fifth-round pick by the Baltimore Ravens, who historically are a tremendous drafting team. And, of course, now Illuminor is having a late a late career resurgence right now, you know, 2017 draft pick, um, is a solid player. And, you know, he's coming off, you know, two of his best seasons. And, by the way, Anthony, um, I'm just going to point this out. You mentioned the, the six sacks and 28 pressures this past season. Might I interest you in his 2022? Two numbers in Priscilla's first season as the offensive line coach, 26 pressures and three sacks um, in 35 more offensive snaps. The guy has been tremendous for two years. And by the way, most of those snaps have come at right tackle, the position we desperately need the most. This is an obvious, obvious link to the Giants. In fact, if I could bet on it right now, Anthony, I think you hit this one on the head. I would put money. The Giants are going to sign Jermaine Illuminor. This is an obvious connection. He is so... This, he will he will provide ample competition at right tackle. In fact, I would be willing to say right now, he would beat the crap out of Evan Neal in a position battle. Evan Neal would be so beat, he would end up at guard. That's how beat he's going to be freaking, he's going to end up. And look, I think a lot of people would project Evan Neal right now as an offensive guard based on his struggles at tackle and his lack of flexibility. Anthony already, already does. Um, I agree with him on that front, absolutely. And what I liked about Illuminor is that he was, after the first four weeks of the season, I mean, Anthony, this is going to get you really excited. Um, after the four, the, the first four weeks of the season, Illuminor gave up one sack after week four, one sack. And it came in week 18 against Denver. He was lights freaking out between weeks five and 18 lights out. He was one of the best pass protectors in on the Raiders, if not in the league. And at the same time was a really solid run blocker. And that's a player I'm interested in right now. I don't think a lot of people are talking about Jermaine Illuminor. But, he, but it meant clearly he's a perfect fit for this uh, blocking scheme. And if the Giants want to upgrade this blocking scheme, they're going to get players that fit this mold. Jermaine Illuminor, I mean, you can already lock it in. I think this dude's signing a contract with us. I, I really think it would be a mistake not to go after him, and he's probably going to be a lot cheaper than alternatives. He'll definitely be cheaper than the alternatives. This is not a big-name player. This is not a guy who's been a full-time starter throughout his career. Like you said, he's a late bloomer. He's having a late career breakout here. But he's having that career propelled by playing under Carmen Brasillo. So I think that he's going to recognize, oh, I played a lot better once I got paired with Brasillo. Brasillo's now over in New York. I'm a free agent. Let me head over there and keep playing under Carmen Brasillo, develop my talents, and compete against some offensive linemen who have been playing really poorly for the New York Giants. I think 
I agree with you. Jermaine Illuminor makes way too much sense. I think he would be a great signing for the New York Giants. I don't know if I'm going to book it in and guarantee it because who knows? Maybe the Giants giant. are going <laughs> to... He's a giant. <laughs> He's a giant. <laughs> maybe, maybe they do get a little bit flashy in free agency and spend big at right tackle. It's possible. There are some names who will be available for a higher price tag, but... I think that if the Giants want to be frugal with their spending, Jermaine Illuminar makes a lot of sense. And still, I think Greg Van Roten makes sense as well because I don't think he's going to cost a whole lot, Alex. And I don't think it hurts to take a flyer on him as a depth piece, right? Like, I know Greg Van Roten, you you have a real sour taste in your mouth about him because of the Jets, um, his history with the Jets. And again, I'm not super high on him because I don't think that he's going to be a great player going forward. He's 33, so his days are almost numbered in the NFL probably. Also, all of his days prior to his days in Las Vegas were not impressive. So the only thing that I would do with Greg Van Roten, one year, super cheap, close to the veteran minute, prove it deal, just to be in there as a depth piece, as a hopeful starter, kind of like your Ben Bredesen last year, you know, where you had him in here and you didn't want him to be your starter. You wanted some of the young guys to take the job, but they didn't. So Ben Bredesen was your starter. That's what I would hope for from Greg Van Roten. You know that he can give you 17 games at right guard if you need him to. You'd prefer if one of your young guards steps in and plays better and takes a starting job. But if they don't, then you have a good backup or, you know, average starter maybe in Greg Van Roten. So that's why I would advocate for signing him on a cheap deal. And again, really like the idea of Jermaine Illuminor. But also just overall really like this hiring of Carmen Brasillo. I know that it's not the flashiest of all hirings. It's not a Mike Munchak. It's not a Dwayne Ledford, but it's still a good hiring in my opinion. And I think that everything that he brings to the table, it's exactly what the New York Giants were looking for. I do think he's a perfect fit in Brian Dable's coaching staff. And I'm hopeful that this, this hiring does pan out in ways that the other offensive line coach hirings that we've made in the past few years, they just haven't. So hopefully Carmen Brasillo is the right guy. But that pretty much wraps this one up. A good discussion on Brian Dable, his personality, the way it's rubbing people the wrong way, and also conversation, uh, or a reaction rather, on Carmen Brasillo joining the New York Giants, which again, we are very excited about. So make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode. And comment your thoughts on the topics down below in the comment section. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review and go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we'll catch you all in the next one. Have a good one. And... Let's go Giants.